Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. Welcome to episode 144 of the GDPR Weekly Show. And coming up in this week's episode, we have news of a cyber attack on a substantial US fuel pipeline. We then travel to Ireland, where there's been a cyber attack on the computer systems used by the Irish Health Service. And then, in response to questions we've been asked to our help desk this week, we have an update on the WhatsApp privacy notice changes. And following on from that, we have news from Germany, where the Hamburg DPA has ordered WhatsApp not to share its data with Facebook. We then look at the whole issue of when you need an EU GDPR agent. And that's become especially pertinent this week because a Canadian company has been fined €525,000 for not having a GDPR agent. And that fine increases by a further €20,000 up to a maximum of another €120,000 for every two weeks that the company still does not have a EU GDPR agent. We then travel to Brent in north-west London where it's emerged that a number of Brent councillors have not completed their mandatory GDPR training. We then have an update on EU COVID-19 vaccination passports and specifically the verdict of the EDPB which has now published its opinion on the use of such passports. And then we look at, so just how much is your personal data worth? We often talk about data being stolen here on the GDPR Weekly Show, but what's in it for the criminals? What do they get from it? Hopefully this short article will provide you with some answers. We then travel to the USA where a presidential order has been signed introducing requirements for a software bill of materials. And finally this week we look at when is a market research company a data controller and when is it a data processor? So as always, a good mix of articles for you this week. We hope you find the articles useful and informative. If you have any feedback for us, please do email us at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We do read every single piece of feedback we receive, and wherever possible, we implement your suggestions for improvements into the show. However, due to the volume of feedback that we receive, it's not always possible to respond to each piece of feedback individually. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse, Thursday, 4pm UK time. We begin this week with news of a major ransomware attack on one of the major fuel pipelines in the USA. Darkside, a cyber criminal gang, say they took the major US fuel pipeline offline solely to make money and not to create problems for society. The US issued emergency legislation on Sunday after Colonial Pipeline was hit by a ransomware cyber attack. The pipeline carries 2.5 million barrels a day, which is 45% of the East Coast supply of diesel, petrol and jet fuel. The operator took itself offline on Friday after the cyber attack, worked to restore the services continuing, although as we go to broadcast we understand that work is almost complete. On Monday this week, the FBI confirmed that Darkside was responsible for compromising Colonial Pipeline's networks, saying that it was continuing to work with the firm and other government agencies on the investigation. The incident was so serious that it even got a mention by the US President Joe Biden when during a speech about the economy at the White House on Monday, he said he'd been personally briefed on the situation and was being updated every day. The agencies across the government have acted quickly to mitigate any impact on our fuel supply, he said. We're preparing to take additional steps depending on how quickly the company is able to bring its pipeline back up to capacity. When asked whether he believed there was Russian involvement in the attack, He said, I'm going to be meeting with President Putin and so far there is no evidence based on our intelligence people that Russia is involved. Darkside posted a statement on its own website on Monday describing itself as apolitical. We do not participate in geopolitics, do not need to tie us with a defined government and look for our motives, the group said. The group also indicated it has not been aware that the China was being targeted by one of its affiliates, saying from today we introduce moderation and check each company that our partners want to encrypt to avoid social consequences in the future. As a result of the cyber attack, US fuel prices at the pump rose 6 cents per gallon on the week to $2.96 per gallon for regular unregulated petrol. On Sunday, the US government relaxed rules on fuel being transported by road to minimise disruption to supply. This allowed drivers in 18 states to work extra or more flexible hours when transporting refined petroleum products. On Sunday, in a statement, Colonial said that although its four main pipelines remained offline, some smaller lines between terminals and delivery points were now operational. Quickly after learning the attack, Colonial proactively took certain systems offline to contain the threat. These actions temporarily halted all pipeline operations and affected some of our IT systems, which we are actively in the process of restoring. 
to loan you a set, it would only bring the full system back online only when we believe it's safe to do so and in full compliance with the approval of all federal regulations. Despite there being no proven Russian government link with Darkseid, it is believed that the organisation is based somewhere in a Russian-speaking country, as although it has instigated cyber attacks worldwide, it has never yet attacked an organisation in a Russian-speaking country, including Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, Armenia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kurdistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. If we get any further updates on this from Colonial, we will just bring them to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Our second article this week also involves a ransomware attack, but this time in Ireland, where the Irish Health Service IT systems were shut down following a ransomware attack. Outpatient appointments at one of Ireland's biggest hospitals have been cancelled amid the ongoing incident. Ireland's healthcare service has been forced to close down its computer systems due to a significant ransomware attack. The Health Service Executive, HSE, confirmed on Twitter on the 14th of May that it had shut down IT systems as a precaution due to the ongoing situation. There is a significant ransomware attack on the HSC IT systems, the Irish Health Service said. We have taken the precaution of shutting down all our IT systems in order to protect them from this attack and to allow us to fully assess the situation with our own security partners. The Health Service said more information on the cyber attack will be published as it becomes available and reassured the public that vaccinations will continue to go ahead as planned. Vaccination registration services will also continue despite the disruption. Speaking to Irish television broadcaster RTE, HSE Chief Executive Paul Reid said cybersecurity staff were working hard to contain the issue. Healthcare IT systems at both the local and national level have been impacted by the cyber attack, he said. It's understood that Rotunda Hospital in Dublin has cancelled stores of outpatient appointments, including maternity appointments. In a statement, the hospital clarified the situation, noting that exceptions will be applied to patients who are 36 weeks pregnant or later. The health service said that members of the public should still attend hospitals if they were faced with an emergency situation. This is an ongoing incident and if we receive any update from either the Irish Health Care Service or the Irish State Protection Commissioner, we will of course bring you an update in next week's TGPL Weekly Show. Stay home, stay safe. We've had a number of inquiries to our help desk this week about the WhatsApp privacy notice update, which is being forced, some say, on WhatsApp users over the next few weeks and whether people should agree to the new privacy notice or not. I think the important thing is, first of all, to say that this privacy notice only affects data that you share with businesses. It does not affect personal WhatsApp accounts. So it's only data you send to businesses, and even then, only data that you put in text WhatsApp messages to businesses. WhatsApp phone calls and video calls are not affected by this update to the privacy notice. We spoke to WhatsApp about the update and they reassured us too that no one is going to be forced to accept the new update. However, they do want people to accept the update and so what they're saying is that whilst at first it will start with a gentle nudge for you to say yes, you accept their new terms, as the days and weeks go on, that prompt to accept the terms will appear on your WhatsApp screen more and more often. And so it becomes more and more of an annoyance, if you like. And so the theory goes that the more annoying it becomes, the quicker you'll do something to stop it appearing. And that's the basis of WhatsApp they're using to get people to complete. However, they are clear that no one is forced to, to, to accept it. If you don't accept it, what will happen is that over time, you'll find yourself unable to access your text messages within WhatsApp. But all of your voice messages and all of your video messaging will continue. That won't be affected at all, even if you don't accept these new terms and conditions. Now, this update has been long delayed. It was originally scheduled for February and then got delayed until May. In a statement, WhatsApp said messaging with businesses is different than messaging with your family or friends. Some large businesses need to use hosting services to manage their communications, which is why we're giving businesses the option to use secure hosting services from Facebook to manage WhatsApp chat chats with their customers, answer questions and send you helpful information like purchase receipts. But whether you communicate with a business by phone, email or WhatsApp, it can see what you're saying and may use that information for its own marketing purposes which may include advertising on Facebook. The company says it will clearly label conversations with businesses that are choosing to use hosting services from Facebook to ensure users are aware when their data may be shared. 
So hopefully that provides some clarification. We may well return to this in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. But in the meantime, if you have any queries about using WhatsApp, please do reach out to us. Email us at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com and one of our team will respond to you. However, following on from our last article, Facebook and WhatsApp aren't having it all their own way because this week Germany's data regulator has banned Facebook from processing any data from WhatsApp users on the basis that its controversial new terms and conditions are illegal under GDPR. Hamburg's Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information issued an emergency order on Tuesday blocking Facebook from processing WhatsApp data for its own purposes for three months. WhatsApp's privacy policy update has already been delayed, as we mentioned in the previous article, Johann Kasper, the head of the German Data Protection Authority, said the order is intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the many millions of users who provided their consent to the terms of use throughout Germany. The global criticism of the new terms of use should give rise to a fundamental rethink of the consent mechanism. Without the trust of users, no database business model can be successful in the long term. When Facebook required WhatsApp back in 2014, it said it wouldn't share data with the service, but since then it has struggled to make WhatsApp make money. In regards to the Hamburg DPA's order, WhatsApp said it is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the purpose and effect of the update and therefore had no legitimate basis. Our recent update explains the options people have to message a business on WhatsApp and provides further transparency about how we collect and use data, a spokesperson for WhatsApp said. As the Hamburg DPA's claims are wrong, the order will not impact the continued rollout of the update. We remain fully committed to delivering secure and private communication for everyone. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse, Thursday, 4pm UK time. If you're a regular listener to the GDPR Weekly Show, you have heard us talk a number of times this year about the need for companies that don't have a permanent place of business within the EU to appoint an EU agent for GDPR purposes. While thanks to COVID and also Brexit, of course, being new, the regulators have taken a fairly relaxed approach to this up to now. They're starting to get tough. And the first country to do that has been the Netherlands, where this week the Dutch Data Protection Authority imposed a €525,000 fine on a company sought to be based in Canada over its failure to designate a EU GDPR representative. Just a reminder, under Article 27 of GDPR, controls or processes that are not established in the EU but nevertheless process EU citizens' personal data for the purposes of offering goods or services or monitoring the behaviour of those citizens must designate in writing a representative in the Union. The designated representative must be based in an EU country where the data subjects whose personal data are processed in relation to offering goods or services to them or whose behaviour is monitored are based. Tasks of the designated representative include liaising with data subjects and regulators, the obligation to appoint a representative does not apply to any bodies in the public sector. The company in question in this particular case in the Netherlands is a website called locatefamily.com, which is a platform that allows users to search for the contact details of people they've lost track of. The DPA's attention was drawn to the company after a series of complaints about the company were raised with its office. Locatefamily.com told the regulator that it had no business relationships in the European Union, is not situated in any country of the European Union, and that it also does not offer goods or services to the European Union. However, a DPI investigation determined that the company's processing of personal data was subject to GDPR, and the company ought to have designated an EU-based representative. The company was given 12 weeks to remedy its breach. If it does not designate an EU data representative in that time, it faces a further fine of €20,000 for each fortnight that then passes without action, up to a total of €120,000. Now, this situation is especially pertinent, of course, here in the UK, because since Brexit, UK GDPR and EU GDPR are not the same, although technically they still maintain an awful lot of similarities. However, it does fall on UK companies who deal with EU citizens who don't have a permanent EU place of business to appoint an EU agent. And this fine now perhaps demonstrates that it is going to become financially important for you to do that. Fortunately, here at the GDPR Weekly Show, we are well set up to provide those EU representative services for you. So if you would like us to do that, please do get in touch with us using the contact details that are coming up right now. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800-808-5312. To Brent 
in northwest London now, where it's emerged that almost half of Brent councillors have yet to complete their mandatory GDPR training. A report presented to Brent Council's Audit and Standards Advisory Committee on May the 11th showed 29 councillors still had work outstanding on the GDPR issue. In a statement, the council said that it was aware that a number of councillors still had to complete their GDPR training and that whilst the pandemic had prevented the normal training procedures within the offices of Brent Council being performed, it was now looking at how this training for GDPR could be delivered remotely so that the councillors could bring their GDPR training up to date. As the restrictions around COVID-19 and movement gradually recede, we've covered several times here on the GDPR Weekly Show about ideas for essentially vaccine passports. And this week, the European Commission announced its plan for a COVID-19 digital green certificate framework. And it said the aim of the framework was to facilitate safe free movement assistance within the EU during the COVID-19 pandemic. The digital green certificate would provide proof that an individual had either been vaccinated against COVID-19, received a negative test result or recovered from COVID-19. The European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor issued a joint opinion on the framework in which they said they had the following recommendations to make. On categories of personal data, they said that while Annex 1 of the framework sets out categories and data fields of personal data that would be processed under the framework, the joint opinion emphasises that the justification for the need for such data fields should also be included in the framework, as well as developing more detailed data fields, i.e. subcategories of data, under the already defined categories of data. These revisions will help ensure that the framework is consistent with several GDPR principles, including data minimisation, purpose limitations and impact assessment. The joint opinion then turns to the adoption of adequate technical and organisational privacy and security measures in the context of the proposal. The joint opinion highlights that the framework should explicitly state that controls and processes of personal data shall take adequate technical and organisational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk of processing in line with Article 32 of GDPR. Also included, the joint opinion suggests the establishment of processes for regular testing, assessment and evaluation of the effectiveness of the privacy and security measures adopted, as well as including language in the framework consistent with GDPR to prevent confusion and ensure relevance. Finally, the joint opinion notes that adoption of privacy and security measures should be taken both at the time of determination of the means of processing as well as at the time of processing itself. Turning then to identification of controllers and processors, the joint opinion recommends that the framework specify the list of all entities foreseen as being acting as controllers, processors and recipients of data in the member state. Identifying these entities will provide EU citizens with an understanding of who they may turn to for the exercise of their data protection rights under GDPR, including in particular the right to receive transparent information on the ways in which their subjects' rights may be exercised with respect to the processing of their personal data. Turning then to transparency and data subjects' rights, the opinion says that the personal data related to the framework is particularly sensitive. As a result, the opinion urges the European Commission to ensure that the transparency of the processes are clearly outlined for citizens to be able to access their data protection rights. Turning to the data storage, the joint opinion notes that to ensure GDPR principles surrounding data storage principles, e.g. storing data no longer than necessary for the purposes for which it was processed, in the context of the framework where possible, the framework should explicitly define, and if that's not possible, then at least provide the specific criteria used to determine what the storage period for the data will be. And then finally, on international data transfers, the joint opinion recommends explicitly clarifying whether and when any international transfers of data are expected, including any safeguards to ensure that third countries will only process the personal data exchanged for the purposes specified within the framework. Now, of course, the EU and the UK are not alone in looking at vaccine passports. There's also action taking place in the USA to establish a vaccine passport. There, the technology, which has been labelled the common pass, will help individuals when travelling globally to demonstrate their COVID-19 status. It's worth noting, however, that some states are actively banning vaccine passport technology and requirements. For example, just last week in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law legislation prohibiting businesses, schools and government offices from requiring proof of vaccination with fines of up to $5,000. But in general, public support of vaccine passports in the US seems to vary by activity. 
Polls have shown that the majority of Americans support proof of vaccinations for travel by airplanes and attending events with large crowds. However, they're less supportive of proof of vaccination at work or for staying in a hotel or dining at a restaurant. Doubtless this is an issue which we will come back to again in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. But if you have any comments about the idea of vaccination passports, we'd love to hear them. So please do send any comments by email to feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. Stay home. Stay safe. We often talk about data breaches and data being stolen, but have you ever really thought how much your data is worth? Well, this week, the results of a survey were published in the USA, and some of the figures are interesting. For complete credit card details with an account balance up to $1,000, that's worth around $150. But if your account balance is up to $5,000, then that information is worth up to $240. Stolen online banking logins with a minimum of $100 in someone's account are currently changing hands for about $40. While stolen online banking logins with a minimum of $2,000 on the account are changing hands for around $120. Turning to PayPal, stolen PayPal account details are changing hands for around $30 a time. But if the PayPal account has a PayPal balance of between $1,000 and $3,000, then those details change hands for around $340 a time. And then looking at social media, a hacked Facebook account, that's going to debt the perpetrator around $65. A hacked Instagram account, around $45. A hacked Twitter account, around $35 and a hat Gmail account around $80. So as you can see, if, if someone's going to a lot of effort and they're only getting details of one or two people, it's probably not a good reward on their effort. But obviously, if they are able to deal the data of thousands of users, then those sums rapidly mount up. As always, perhaps it's a good incentive to make sure that all your data is kept securely. And of course, that's one of the key principles of GDPR. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. There was an important development for software developers in the USA this week when a new presidential executive order was signed, highlighting the need to enhance the software supply chain as one of the measures of improving the nation's cybersecurity. The executive order solidifies a previous announcement about what companies must disclose to the US government when a data breach occurs. Like the rules already in place in the state of California, these new rules will shield software developers from legal liabilities associated with a data breach disclosure. However, due diligence is required on behalf of software companies, which includes evidence collected and shared with federal law enforcement. A significant part of the disclosure is what's known as a software bill of materials, a comprehensive inventory of all included software components, both internally developed, third-party and open source. So, put plainly, a software bill of materials is a list of all software components used in a software product. The increase in use of third-party and open-source codes means that most software released today is comprised of software developed internally and externally from the company releasing it. Any quality and security issues in these reused components live on in the new product and as such expose a risk that remains hidden to the end consumer. In fact, software developers may themselves be unaware of the vulnerabilities and dependencies buried in the code they reuse. And so what this essentially means is that if you're creating a new piece of software, and you're making use of either open source code or third-party add-ins, then you must document those third-party add-ins and open source software and have that available so that if a data breach does occur, then you're able to say with some certainty which open source software and which third-party software your application itself is using. Now, at the moment, this is restricted to the US, but we will keep a close eye on this because we suspect these same obligations may well transfer to the European side of the Atlantic at some point in the not-too-distant future. Should we have any updates of that kind, we will, of course, bring them to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. And we end this week with a ruling from the EDPB on when a market research company is a processor or a controller. What the ruling says is that, by default, a market research company should be considered a data controller, However, they can be considered a data processor where any of the following conditions are true. Assuming that the market research company are retained by a third-party company to provide insights regarding a specific issue, the market research company would not determine the purpose of processing and therefore the data controller would be the company commissioning the market research company. Equally, they've ruled that if the company retaining the market research company 
actually provides a list of questions to be asked of consumers, the market research company would not determine the data types to be processed and therefore, again, the company commissioning the market research would be the data controller. Equally, if the market research company does not retain the data or only retains it for as long as instructed, then again, the market research company would be considered a data processor. The only still slightly grey issue is it's not clear whether a market research company that identifies survey respondents would exercise sufficient control over the selection of the categories of data subjects as to function as a data controller. The EDPB implied, however, that if a market research company conducted research regarding the types of consumers that would most likely be interested in one of its clients' products, the selection of data subjects to participate in the market research would not in itself convert the market research company into a data controller. So hopefully that makes that clear. But but as always, if you have any commercial situations where you're unsure whether you are a data processor, a data controller, or indeed a joint data controller, then please do just contact us using the details which are coming up at the end of this article. And we'd be delighted to help you through the maze to determine which category you are, whether you're a data processor, a data controller, or a joint data controller. So those contact details are coming up right now. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800 808 5312. The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurance production. Until next time, bye-bye.